Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. It's the break and sympo SIP symposium today, so I wasn't really expecting anybody. But um, it's great that you're here. Um, the other thing is that uh, I really want to present something that is, has some uh, relation to breeding, because obviously this is the breeding department. And um, the Next Gen Cassava project has an important basis here at Cornell. And so my fear is a little bit that I'm not really showing you anything new because a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people have talked about cassava before. And um, some of you may also realize that I've stolen some slides from Jean-Luc and, and so on. So um, apologies for that. <laughs> um, so, so many things should be very familiar to you already. So there will not be uh, big surprises, I guess. So my talk is uh, entitled um, From Data to Improve Crops, uh, the Role of Databases. And of course, people have stored data in breeding for a long, long time. Uh, traditionally, it was done uh, in books like this. Uh, this is actually, I think, a photo from Peter Kaleko's office in um, IITA. And these are actual cassava breeding records. And um, obviously, you know, if you have your data in this form that has a lot of advantages, uh, for example, you don't need electricity to read it. You know, that can be a really important factor. Or the resolution is pretty good, you know, so it's very <laughs> user friendly. <laughs> Stuff like that. But, you know, if you want to make a backup, it's hard. If you want to uh, make any calculations on the data, very hard. So that's why people moved on, and the next thing they moved to is Excel. And Excel has a lot of advantages. Uh, you now need a computer and electricity and stuff like that. Um, it's easier to back up. You can send it to a friend. But it's really not so ideal when you want to combine data. For example, you know, you have your Excel sheets from last year and the year before. Well, how are you going to look at both data? You have to find that Excel sheet first. And then you might have to combine them into one sheet to make it easy to analyze. <coughs> but your columns might not match up. You know, there might be different things in the columns. You paste columns and you mess up everything. So, so there, there's a lot of issues with Excel. With data, data management in Excel um, is, is difficult. So I would argue that in traditional breeding, um, obviously, people have um, regarded the genome as a, as a black box. And the black box is kind of an engineering term. And it means that you know the behavior of a system, but you cannot look inside and see how it actually works. Okay? And then in traditional breeding, the breeders have learned really how the system behaves and have learned to exploit that. But they could not um, look inside because the tools were not available. Obviously, they've become available only uh, in the past 10 or 20 years. And that's exactly what happened. So um, we have entered the genome era quite a long time ago uh, with, uh, for those who remember Arabidopsis, uh, in 2000 it came out, the genome. And since then the rice and maize and all these important crops have been sequenced after Arabidopsis. And in the last five years, I guess we got genome sequences for everything, okay? So uh, how can we use this genome sequence um, to improve breeding, and how can we look inside the box and use our understanding of the box inside uh, to improve breeding. And so it turns out that when you, do, uh, when you have these genome sequences, these reference sequences, that actually doesn't help you all that much because you don't really know uh, what the different sequences do, right? So what you really need is, um, I mean, it's a good foundation, but what you really need now is diversity data. And you need to know, uh, you know, what is the diversity out there, uh, genetically, but also phenotypically, right? And, and so you need to do, what you need to do is you need to collect a large amount of, uh, of genetic uh, variation using maybe resequencing. Maybe that's becoming really possible today. Uh, or at least high-density high genotyping. And those, that creates data sets that are very large. And so now I think at this point, when you move to that point, I don't think you want to do anything in Excel because you don't want to do 100,000 markers per clone in Excel. But anyway, so these data sets can be very large. And at this point, I think you will want, what you will want is um, 
a really nice um, database that people can access from anywhere in the world and that you know, does calculations for you and predictions and uh, correlations and you know, makes your breeding data available for, for last year and the last maybe 50 years so that you have everything immediately uh, at your fingertips, all the information. So let's imagine that you um, have a large collection of genotypes and phenotypes. Well, now you can, uh, you can correlate. Let's say you have, you have phenotyped. Why is this always beeping? I don't know. I tried to fix it. I don't know. Is this my computer beeping, or is this the other one? I don't think so. Anyway. <laughs> it's a bug. It's a, it's a hacker, probably. Um, um, that's when I press this. <laughs> Using this. <laughs> anyway, so um, so let's say you have a huge population and you have uh, phenotyped it maybe for yield, and you also have a nice genotyping assay, and you get a lot of markers. So now imagine in your head, you know, yield as one trait and hundred thousand markers. Okay, so that's hard to imagine. So let's just pick out one of these markers, and let's see how. Um, and this is an interesting marker because this this marker, the genotype, as we see there, AA, you know, would be like uh, some reference. AB would be heterozygous and BB homozygous uh, alt, uh, alternate allele. It has definitely an eff effect on that trait if you if you make these correlations, and these correlations have to be done in a in a certain statistical way, uh, so that they're they're meaningful, it's actually statistically, uh, you know, use uh, blobs to do that. Um, but now you see this, this, this uh, genotype, this marker, this one marker, has definitely an effect on, on the trait, right? So what you can do now is um, you could take that whole genotype and take all these markers that have an effect and somehow integrate it over the entire genotype. Right, so from, from the 100,000 markers, there will be a lot of markers that will have effects, but most of them will have no effects, really, right? So um, you have, somehow have to integrate over the entire genome. And of course, you know, the simplest way is just to sum up all these uh, marker effects. And then, you know, what, what is really surprising or amazing to me, and I'm still amazed at that, although I've known this for, for years, <laughs> that you can do that, is that you can predict phenotypes from genotypes. So we can actually predict the future. So if you have a seed, we can say the plant will look like this. You will have the size of. So we can predict the future. So the genome is not a black box anymore. It's um, it's like a crystal ball. So in, and you know, crystal balls predict the future. You have to use some um, magic spells uh, and so on. It turns out that they don't make the crystal balls in that shape anymore. Now it's more rectangular. And um, you still have to use magic spells. <laughs> For example, there's one magic spell called SQL <laughs> or Java. <laughs> um, or, you know, um, cassava-based.org is a magic spell that you might want to use if you want to access or predict uh, cassava plants. So that leads us to uh, really the... Um, um, that field of um, breeding called predictive breeding. Uh, and uh, I think the major methodology is usually referred to as uh, genomic selection, where you build these models from, as, as I've said, just you know, for entire genotypes and for many, many traits. Um, and you build these correlations, and then you basically can use genotypic data instead of, you know, you don't have to phenotype the progeny. You can just genotype it and predict the phenotype. Um, and this is for, on, on the one side, this is heavily used in animal breeding. I think it has been used for at least 10 to 15 years in animal breeding, especially for uh, milk cows. And milk cows, obviously, that, that trait has the big problem that you cannot phenotype one of the parents, right? And that, that one other parent also contributes, of course, to the milk um, cap uh, capacity of the offspring, but you have no idea how much. So you can, you can do experiments, you can you know, make crosses and analyze the progeny, and you know, geneticists have done that for years, but uh, it's a, extremely time consuming and extremely expensive. 
So if you just could genotype the bull and say, well, that's his potential for milk and it's really high, I want to combine it with uh, this really high potential cow, um, it's much faster and much, uh, much cheaper. So this is a slide I, I stole from Jean-Luc. Um, so what is breeding all about? Yeah, breeding is about you know, uh, improving your uh, breeding population. And you may have a breeding target. So in, you know, in terms of cassava, this might be, this is where we have to be in yield to save humanity. That's the red bar, right? Um, but our population is really not there. Our population uh, you know, has maybe a yield that is uh, nicely uh, distributed like that but it's far removed to the left, meaning the yield is much, much lower. And so what you do is, of course, you make selections, and um, you make crosses, and you select again, and these are breeding cycles. So by selecting the really good ones from C0 and crossing them again will allow you to uh, move that distribution over, in, in, uh, over time. And you know this breeding target seems really impossible to attain, but if you're really good at it, and if you're repeated several times, you might actually reach this target maybe after four iterations. So why is this important for uh, our genomic selection? Well, um, as you see, the number of um, cycles you go through uh, is important because if with each cycle you advance a certain, uh, a certain amount. Now, if we could cycle faster, then we would move much faster to the target, right? Because it's per cycle. And so um, there is this um, equation uh, that gives you the gain per year. And uh, as you see, the time per cycle is here uh, in, uh, below. So meaning if that um, cycle time gets, uh, gets smaller, the gain per year gets, gets larger, OK? Of course, there's a lot of other things in it. Uh, the selection intensity, which means you know what is that subgroup that I'm taking, what is that relationship that mean to the uh, mean of the whole population? Uh, or the selection accuracy, if I'm not very good at making accurate selections, obviously that should lower uh, my gain uh, per, uh, per cycle. And of course, we also need variation. Imagine there was no variation and this distribution was just a line, you wouldn't be able to advance the line. So the key thing is that this genomic selection um, methods allow you to, to uh, cycle much faster in plants. Because we don't, we don't have the milk problem, but we, we want to be faster, OK? And so how this is implemented, that's also a slide that I think I've seen 10 times already here. In this. So I'm not sure if you're bored when I show this uh, slide again. But I think it's an important slide because it really illustrates how genomic selection is implemented in um, in breeding programs and usually have a model training cycle where you create really the data that you use for uh, the correlations and the line development cycle where you really produce uh, you know, your, um, your crosses and you select by um, the genotype and the model that you have developed in the training cycle. So we have applied this. Um, this methodology in the, in the Next Gen Cassava project, and this is a very large uh, project. Um, and so you know, we do a lot of uh, genotyping and phenotyping, and we then build these models and try to really uh, go through the uh, breeding program <laughs> um, using genomic selection. So the, uh, the project is quite large and has other aspects to it. Um, like Tim Setter is uh, working on the Improvement of flowering, cassava is um, is famous for not setting, you know, not having a lot of flowers. So it's difficult to do genetics if you don't have flowers. Uh, another important component is uh, gender and gender preferences. Um, and Hale Tufan uh, is is responsible for that part. Um, but of course, it's also a huge data management challenge, and that's really the part where. Um, you know, the work of my lab comes in. Um, you have more information about the project at nextgencassava.org. So I guess everybody knows what cassava is at this point. Has, has anybody not heard about cassava? Everybody. Nobody's heard about cassava. <laughs> <laughs> a 
<laughs> okay, I'll go over the slide then. <laughs> Al-Kasab is a tropical and subtropical plant, um, and it's grown for the starchy roots. Uh, it is native to South America, but was uh, brought by the Portuguese to Africa about four, five hundred years ago, and is now a really important uh, food crop uh, for you know hundreds of millions of people. You know, you see different, different you know values for that number, but. It is a huge number, okay? It's hundreds of millions. Uh, it's clonally propagated, and what, what has always fascinated me about, um, about it is actually toxic. So it ac accumulates this uh, uh, toxic cyanogenic uh, glu glucosides, linamarin, for example, that's this structure, and so you have to process it before consumption. And so we created this uh, database called Cassava Base, and it's available at, at cassavabase.org. Um, recently, we have applied the same database model to other plants, and one of them is uh, banana. Um, these projects are not as, uh, as ambitious, maybe, at this point as cassava. Cassava is by far the most advanced project where we really try to do genomic selection. These projects are more about setting up the stage so that you could do that uh, in these projects. And all of these other plants we're working with, they have little problems. Um, cassava is actually fairly straightforward. It doesn't flower too well. But <coughs> apart from that, it's a, it's a diploid genome. Um, it's, it's, uh, we have a pretty good ge reference genome. Um, so we are trying to apply uh, to, to uh, create a breeder's database about banana. But banana is, uh, is a very complicated way of breeding. I don't know if you're familiar with banana breeding. Does anybody understand banana breeding? Nobody. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't include myself in that set either because it's really, really complicated. Um, so what we are talking about is not uh, dessert bananas like the Cavendish banana that you buy in the store here. That's um, a different type of... Uh, it's actually biologically really the same because they're all the same species. Um, but it's a different line, and it's a clonal line. So all the bananas that are grown in the world is basically one, one identical clone. And <clears throat> that's, of course, problematic, as you <clears throat> may have heard, that um, there is this disease called Panama disease that attacks all the, all the bananas, uh, the Cavendish variety. So Matoke bananas and Chare bananas that we, are work, that we work with that are grown in the East uh, African highland, um, and in Tanzania, they are resistant to Panama disease. They are, it's not a problem for them. So that's what we're working with. Um, the Matoke bananas um, are, are from Uganda, and they are triploid, as is Cavendish, is also triploid, uh, and they have different uh, genome structures. Uh, interestingly, the Machari bananas from Tanzania, they are diploid. Um, and so anyway, you can imagine that you have, if you have triploidy in your breeding scheme, that things can get very complicated. Okay, so that's just, I'm just saying that. <laughs> um, another um, plant we have applied the database to is, is yam. And yam uh, actually is also interesting because yam is, um, is actually not one, one single species. There are a lot of different species of yam that are being used for breeding. Um, yam is actually a monocot uh, and has nothing to do with uh, sweet potato. And in the US, if you go to the store and buy a yam, sometimes it's a sweet potato. Sometimes these terms, these names are used interchangeably. But in terms of bot botany, uh, the two couldn't be further apart almost. Um, so they're just look, the, the, they look very similar in, in terms of their root or their, um, yeah. Another interesting factoid is it, dioecious. So they're actually male and female um, plants. And this is a collaboration with, uh, with IITA, with uh, Robert Asiedu and, and, and colleagues. Then to make things confusing, we also work on sweet potato, which is awfully confused with yam, as you remember. Uh, but it is a convolvulase. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, the little problem that this one has it is hexaploid. So hexaploid is not good for breeding, uh, I guess, uh, and genotyping and so forth. Everything is, makes, is much harder when you have a hexaploid. But it's a really important plant uh, in Africa as well. Uh, the, the PI is Craig Yancho uh, in, uh, and CSU, 
And uh, Ted Carey is um, a breeder in Ghana that is participating. There are a lot of other breeders involved. Uh, and we also co collaborate with the Sasha project. Um, and the uh, PIs of the Sasha project just won the uh, uh, World Food Prize. So that's, that was a good, good thing. So, so we have all these different databases. And really, what, what, what I want to show you is, uh, is um, a phylogeny of databases. So we are creating these databases. And it, it all goes back to this uh, tomato database that Jeff mentioned in the introduction. Uh, we created this database. And then off this database, we created cassava base a few years ago. And then from this database, split off a sweet potato base, musa base, and yam base. So the, th the three I just mentioned. And more recently, we created another database uh, called uh, citrusscreening.org that deals with the citrus screening disease. Okay. Uh, and so I, I kind of, this is how they developed. But the truth of the matter is they, uh, the code behind all of them is exactly the same. Okay. So uh, they all work exactly in the same way. And then they're just customized uh, for the different projects. So but let's go back to cassava. So um, this is a map, actually, of the cassava production. Um, apparently, the borders are very strictly maintained here in cassava production. I assume we have no data for this. But uh, um, anyway, so, so the darker the, 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 the pixels are, the more cassava is grown. And um, this is Nigeria, uh, so the, the two of the very dark areas here. Uh, one is Nigeria and one is um, Uganda. And so we work with uh, two centers in Nigeria, IITA and NRCRI, and a center in uh, Uganda, which is uh, NACRI, um, in the context of the Next Gen Cassava project. So, in, um, so what we have tried to do, we have seen that you know, speeding up the cycle is really the major way that uh, genomic selection could help us in plants. And so cassava traditionally had a cycle that goes from three, three to five years, OK? And so here, uh, at least in IITA, they were very ambitious, and they wanted to implement a one-year cycle. Um, <clears throat> so we get a, about a speed up of, of five, three to five times. Um, and so these are the cycles that have actually been completed. So cycle zero is just the historical uh, the population, essentially. It's also 750 clones that were very, very, you know, were, were selected, handpicked to be good clones. Um, they were um, um, phenotyped and genotyped. And then they were, uh, you know, uh, population was uh, crossed, selected and crossed. 2,500 seedlings were, were genotyped. Um, those were, you know, predicted again. Uh, crossed, selected, and so forth. And this was done until cycle three. Uh, currently, we're still at cycle three. Now we are in a, kind of in a two-year phase for some reason. <clears throat> but all this has, has been done. And so it's, it's actually possible to have a one-year cycle using genomic selection in cassava. And if the protocol works well, you would imagine that you get you know, a five times, three to five times better um, yield increase. So this is just to show you uh, what, what this looks like in, in the field. This is the cycle two clones that was in 2014. And um, so these, these uh, are about a, a few weeks old. Um, so the, the field looks very organized. But of course, they grow quite large. And I've not, if you have seen a, a cassava field uh, with older plants on it, um, it's very difficult to go, get, go through it because it's very, the plants go, grow very large. So anyway, so how does this relate to database and phenotyping? Well, um, if, you, if you want to use a database, you have to have certain um, prerequisites that you have to meet. For example, uh, if you have a large project and a lot of people do phenotyping in this project, you have to have very well standardized um, trait dictionaries. Uh, you have to have, uh, you know, everybody has to agree on trait naming. Uh, everybody has to measure all the tra traits in exactly the same way. Uh, everybody has to use the same units or the same scales. 
And I found that this is one of the hardest part of the project. You know, programming a website is, is hard maybe, but it's doable. But getting everybody to agree on, <laughs> on the same trade name is really, really hard. Or the same, you know, the same measurement, because everybody has their favorite little way to measure things. Uh, and so this kind of, this part of the, the, the agreement is, is, is really difficult sometimes to reach. But uh, in cassava, it was relatively easy, because actually the cassava uh, breeders had started a long time ago um, to do this, uh, to have trade dictionaries. And so their trade dictionary was actually fairly, fairly um, um, standardized already. Um, we're working now with other plants, and, and it's much, much more difficult. But for cassava, for example, we got all the data from uh, SIAT uh, in South America. Um, and that data went back to 1974, I think. And that's when they already start, thought, thought about standardization. And so we could actually load most of the data in, into the database. Going, going back to 1974, that's really, really unusual. Of course, you, you want to use this also to kind of uh, reduce operator error. You want to really define and validate your uh, input scales. Uh, breeders like to have scores. For example, they want, they want to have scores from 1 to 5. And of course, it has to be very precisely defined what uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are. Uh, but importantly, you cannot say 6. <laughs> and that's sometimes a problem. Because when you have Excel sheets or, or free input forms, you will, you will get six, okay? Or you get 2.5. Um, so, um, so the, you know, having a database will really allow you to reject those values um, and, and improve the, the quality of the data. Another, another important point I want to make is that, you know, you really, um, you think about a database, and I think most breeders initially uh, that we worked with thought about the database and about their breeding program as being two, two things that are completely separate, right? So you go do something in the database, you do, go <laughs> do something in the field, but really the two have to be totally connected. You know, it has to be, the data flow has to be really integrated completely in, into, the, into the breeding process. Otherwise, it just plain doesn't work. So this is just to say that we work with uh, crop ontology um, people who maintain all these ontologies, and we try to, um, um, you know, stay up to date with their versions of the ontologies. Uh, and so they have an ontology for pretty much every every crop in the world, um, and and they have decided they can everybody can download the ontology and so forth. For the phenotyping, we use uh, tablet-based phenotyping in the field. Uh, these are Android tablets, um, so they are very very cheap. Um, initially, there was some resistance because people were thinking, yeah, in the sun, I can't read uh, the screen and so on, but it's all been debunked. It works really well, uh, and people love it now. So people love these uh, Android field books. They run a software called um, Android Fieldbook <laughs> from Jesse Poland's lab, and it's simply in the Google Play Store, and you can, uh, you can just download it with one click. Uh, as I learned, not in China, because they have the big firewall. So I was in China, wanted to give a demo, and no Google Store there. So you, can't, you cannot download this. So we have to remember, download it before. <laughs> so what I, what, I was, uh, what I was referring to before with um, you know, being, having to be integrated in the, in the breeding process um, is really that your, your information flow and what you do in the field have to be totally connected. So for example, if you want to collect phenotyping data, you know, the process in the database starts even before you plant the field, okay? Because you're the breeder, this is this one here, and he doesn't go to the field, he goes to the computer first. But that's already, you know, for a breeder, that's maybe not, not you know, traditionally not, not super natural thing to do. But you go to the computer and you uh, connect to the database and you tell the database, I want to like to have a trial with these accessions in it. Uh, and, the, and the database will actually tell you that's how you will have to plant them. You know, the randomization is done by, by the database, and then the, um, the breeder, not the database goes to the field, but the breeder goes to the field and plants uh, that accordingly to that, to that field plan. Then, you know, the field grows, and you want to phenotype, 
Well, to phenotype, you just don't go, you just don't go to the field and you know take some notes. What you have to do is you have to uh, you want to load it back into the database, so the database has to know what you're looking at. So uh, what what we're doing in our system, we can export data about the trial and about the field layout to the Android field book. You go phenotyping, and then you upload that data again. It's very very important that this be followed. Uh, Otherwise, there is just chaos in the end. Because you don't know, you know, when you just go to the field and collect data, you don't know what data point that, uh, where the database should store that data point. And if everything goes well, you get home from the field, you take your field, uh, Android field book and you can upload all the data. And the database you know, has a page about uh, the specific trial where it, uh, all the data will appear. And there will be some simple statistics calculated, and uh, you'll see some distributions uh, of the different traits and so forth. And also, uh, you know, calculate some other statistics such as uh, correlation of traits and so forth. So, how much data do we have in the database uh, since we started? And so, this one is um, uh, the, the number of um, accessions and the number of phenotypes in the database. In 2013, when we started, uh, to 2016 uh, today, and you can see the growth has been quite phenomenal. Um, most of that growth is is not from active breeding programs, but from loading of historical data. Uh, and a lot of this one is uh, the SIAT data that I mentioned. But you see that we have um, almost nine million phenotypic scores and uh, about 100,000 accessions in the database right now. And they're about in, I think, in about 2,500 uh, trials. Of course, this data is useless if you just store it in the database. You also have to be able to retrieve the data uh, and to work with it. Uh, and there, of course, Cassava Base uh, gives you a lot of different ways to, to uh, query the database. Uh, one of the nicest ways, I think, is the search wizard. Uh, and the search wizard really allows you to slice your data uh, using a number of different parameters that are in these pull-down menus. So for example, you can say, I want to see all the breeding data um, by year. So give me that maybe year 2015 and 2016. And then you can say, well, I want to select, uh, I, want to, I only want to see IITA's breeding <coughs> data for these two years. Uh, and uh, so you can select breeding programs, you click on IITA. Then you can select the next um, drop-down and say, well, at which locations did IITA um, produce data in 2015 and 2016, and it will give you these locations where, uh, th so this, those are only locations where uh, IITA did experiments in these two years. And then you can say, well, give me all the uh, accessions for, you know, any number of locations there. This is a really powerful tool, and uh, breeders uh, love it. So how, how do we deal with the genotyping side? Well, genotyping has to be, of course, very high throughput. It has to be cheap. And uh, we have so far used genotyping by sequencing. Um, you know, this basically um, doing genotyping using next-gen sequencers. Uh, it's highly uh, multiplexed and thus uh, very cheap. Uh, unfortunately, somebody made a patent uh, for this uh, method. Um, and so now we have to look for another method. But, uh, it's uh, very annoying, <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a, you know the, the method has really worked um, really well. Uh, also, when you when you do genotyping, you need um, you need to integrate uh, the genotyping pipeline with the breeding program. Um, the real challenge is that you well, you know when you do phenotype based breeding, uh, you don't really. Uh, have to be so careful with maybe um, the data management because you always look at the plant. But when you do genotyping, the genotype is somewhere else and your phenotype is somewhere else. So you need to really connect, the, the two connect only in the database, okay? So that's why it's really important that this connection be made and be made correctly. So um, storing genotypes is actually a very voluminous uh, uh, data, very, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. If you think about the raw data, we have in the order of 20,000 accessions now in the database. 
And if you look at how, many, how much read data that is, that's about six terabytes of read data. Obviously, you don't want to query that directly. So we have uh, pipelines that we run, and we process this um, essentially to, um, so that each, each uh, marker is, is one data point. Um, but even so, um, we get about, from that data, we get about 100,000 markers uh, per genotype. And so if you have 20,000 accessions, that's about uh, 2 billion data points. That's a quite a fair number of data points. So we need uh, special techniques for, for rapidly querying all that data. And so we have implemented our own way at present to, to um, query that, that, that data. It works very well, but we think it will not scale beyond maybe a few hundred thousand genotypes. And we really want something that in the end, that is scalable to millions of, data of genotypes. And so there, a new project started at Cornell and at BTI called Gobi that will implement a, a very large scale database that should you know, scale to tens or hundreds of millions of genotypes. And the, the um, URL is there, gobiproject.org. So how do, you how do you make the prediction of uh, the phenotypes in the database? Well, we have a tool called uh, Sol GS, and that does all the work for you. You can go there and build models. You can go there and predict uh, genotype um, breeding values. Uh, in the end, you, you know you can use several several traits, and in the end, it will allow you to build a, a selection index and um, sort sort by selection index and uh, use that to uh, advance your breeding cycle. So how does it work? Well, um, so if you start a Sol GS tool, it will give you some information about your data set, the distribution of your phenotypic values. Uh, it will give you a PCA of population structure so that you can see uh, that everything is okay with your input data. Uh, then it builds the model. And when it builds the model, it gives you some uh, data about the model. For example, it, it calculates uh, model accuracy um, by uh, sub-segmenting the the sets and, and uh, calculating the, the model and, and, and uh, you know, looking at predictions and observations. Uh, and then it will also give you uh, the major marker effects. Uh, and then you can use these models uh, and uh, you know, feed the tool with the genotype data, uh, which is already in the database. So you just need to say you know, this line, this line, and this line in a list, and uh, it will calculate at the selection index, and again, you know, you can use that to rank your germplasm. So initially, we just wanted to build a database that has phenotypic and genotypic data in it, and you use SolGS to make the predictions, but it turns out that that's uh, not a good idea. You really have to run your entire program through a database because you don't want your information in different places. So. Um, we built a lot of tools uh, that you can manage the breeding program right through cassava base, and it allows you things such as you know, keeping track of pedigrees, crosses, trials and nurseries, and the selection of progeny. So you know, there's a pedigree management tool. Every um, line has uh, you know, its pedigree displayed in a graphical way. You can manipulate this pedigree. You can remove or add. Um, parents and so forth, and edit that. This is how it looks like on the detail page. Uh, you can create a cross in the database. So you tell the database, make a cross. Uh, you know, there are different cross methods that you can select. And it will create um, progeny and, and other metadata about the cross uh, in the database that you can then use directly um, uh, in, in, for further experiments in the database. Of course, you can also create a trial, as already mentioned. Um, we keep all the metadata about the trial, the location, the year, um, the planting dates. Uh, um, you can select the design type, and the design type will um, you know, then inform the, uh, the randomization that the tool will make. And we'll store that uh, in the database. And now when you want to phenotype, you, know, you have um, 
you have the metadata in the database to associate the phenotypes to the correct location in the database. We'll also soon have this uh, tool. Uh, we are kind of working more on analytical tools. Uh, and we, we will create a tool to, to better compare trials. I just want to briefly uh, mention um, about the implementation of cassava base. So this is an uh, enterprise grade uh, database. Um, it's based on a Postgres SQL um, data, relational database framework. Uh, for the, for the uh, web server, we use a Catalyst uh, web framework uh, with a Mason um, toolkit. For the user interface, you have started using Bootstrap a lot, which is a really beautiful uh, JavaScript library. Uh, and otherwise, you use a lot of very standard code, like BioPerl and Chado and, and other Gmod components, which is a, a basically a group of people have put their tools together. And it's very useful um, to, um, to work with, with these tools, because they're kind of standardized. So for the, <clears throat> for the relation database, we have developed a schema that has several hundred tables. This includes uh, the Chado tables and uh, extensions to Chado. And we have created a standard extension called Natural Diversity a Module uh, that is now part integral part of Chado. But we, you know, the, we did this in, com uh, in collaboration with some uh, other, other databases. So everything is open source. Um, you can go to uh, GitHub and you can look at all uh, the code, all the commits, all the diffs, all the contrib contributors, um, and you can download everything if you want. Um, you see we have, we have almost 12,000 commits now. Um, that's since we switched to GitHub, I guess, uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah, and you, you can look at everything. Uh, it's all open source. Another important, another important activity is, uh, Breeders need to actually use this software. And how do they know about this software? Um, uh, so what we're doing is we're organizing a lot of workshops. Uh, so somebody from the lab is almost always, almost always somebody of the lab is in Africa. <laughs> right now there are actually two guys in Africa, Isaac and, and Guillaume. They're giving workshops at, uh, at IITA. Uh, and these are just some pictures uh, from workshops. This is actually uh, Jeremy Edwards, who used to work at Kosawa Base. I'm giving a workshop in uh, IITA, IITA and in NRCRI. And here is uh, Alex and Brian uh, giving a workshop in, in Ghana, in Kumasi, with uh, Ted Carey. But there are lots and lots of, of workshops like that. So the question is, you know, and I think you have seen this slide before, uh, if you do all this, um, do you actually see the gains that you, that you wanted? Okay, and so we have done three cycles uh, and, and they're complete. So we actually, we actually can look at whether, whether um, we get um, you know, better performance. And so um, I, just, I think a lot, a lot of other talks have talked about, about these results. So I just wanna, just wanna uh, briefly illustrate that it seems to work. Uh, and I just wanna show this uh, trait uh, dry matter and you see the three selection cycles. And of course you see that the mean um, you know, goes up. And that's a good thing. Um, so that's what, what we expected. Um, so so the, dry, the dry matter uh, you know, trait seems to be one that's very amenable to, to, to this technology. You also see that you know, the interesting thing is the mean goes up, but I guess the top value here is uh, it's pretty constant. So, I guess you would imagine that this trait does have some kind of biological limit, uh, but we still have a, have a lot of ways to go to, to reach that. So conclusions, I guess I could convince you that if you do large scale phenotyping and genotyping breeding programs that you need a database, um, it, it is really much better for, um, for you know, the quality control. You can track all the plants and plots and phenotypes um, you really have your data in an integrated way. You can interrogate, you can slice the data by year, by, uh, by breeding program, by anything you want. Um, and it's great for data sharing. So before we started um, Cassava Base, um, 
the cassava breeders would keep their data secret. I mean, they would not share that data. And they were very surprised that the Gates Foundation would ask them to share all the data. They said, no, we, we, don't, we don't want to do that. We don't share data. You know, breeders, uh, maybe I'm putting words uh, in somebody's mouth here, but I think breeders don't have a culture of sharing data because they see the data as their, um, you know, um, competitive edge or something like that. Um, but now I think they have become very comfortable with the idea to put all the data out there, and it's, it's fine. And the other, the other important point is, you know, you need to have all your breeding process and data flows integrated with the database. If that, there's a disconnect somewhere, uh, the whole model breaks down because you will not be able to link these genotypes back to your phenotypes, and that would be sad. So I just want to uh, acknowledge all the people who work uh, on, on this project, obviously at IITA, uh, at NACRI, at NRCRI, or of course locally here at Cornell, and other associated projects. Uh, the funding is from BMGF and DFID and Cornell. And this is the uh, lab at BTI. We're actually, actually that's, um, including some visitors and student interns. So the, the core lab is a little bit smaller than that. Uh, Isaac is, um, is he's telecommuting the, uh, from the Netherlands. That's why he's down here. Um, and he is, um, he's the one responsible for the, for the SolGS tool. Okay, so thank you.